All right, so I just check we are recording, okay, so I suspect uh, the other half of the class would appreciate the recording because they're not here yet. <laughs> All right, so this is your new homework assignment. Um, so today we do not have a quote-unquote usual lab. Um, there's still lab, meaning that I will be here, okay, and you have some activity that you can do during the lab time, which is this particular activity. So this is a real program, okay? So in other words, you know, we have, you know, some, we have uh, at least one program to write here you know, at this point. I'll give you the other one, you know, on uh, next Tuesday. So this one, you know, I'm just going to describe and also kind of give you an outline of how to do this particular homework assignment um, step by step. Um, so we'll start with, you know, just reading the text, okay, the instructions of this particular, you know, um, activity here, okay, and just want to magnify a little bit so, you, you know, people in the back can also read it more carefully. All right, so the assignment involves completing the E10 to E2 function in C code. Uh, this is a resource that I really, you know, prefer to use, you know, online. You do not need to install your own compiler nor debugger uh, because it is all web-based. Uh, for those of you who know how to use Redlit, it is sort of like Redlit, except the debugging capability is much better with this particular resource. So it's up to you to decide how you want to write your program. Um, since all of you have taken CISP 360, because that's the prerequisite of this class, I am assuming that you know how to run a C compiler. Uh, you can use VS Code, you can use code blocks, you can use uh, just regular GCC on the command line, or you, know, you can just use the online resource here, or Redlet. So however you want to do it is up to you. The code just has to be working when I compile and test it. Okay, so that's the bottom line. Do we have any questions about setting up an environment to write C code? Okay. So I don't have, we don't have anyone coming from, from Sac State you know, where you know, only Java is taught. All right, excellent. Okay, so I'm just going to go to this you know, resource here. I open a new tab. Just so that you can see what it looks like, you know, this is basically what online GDB looks like. Is it is just a web page, and you can write C programs and also to run the debugger to test your code. So that's going to be the most important part: is how do you check to make sure that your code is correct, that is working. So getting back to here, um, so to write and test your C program as a single source file. So this is a link. Okay, so I suggest that you right click on it and then click on save link as so that you can save the code. Um, the program is called monolith.c. It is a single C file. In other words, you, you don't need to like download a bunch of files with header files and whatnot. This is self-contained. So it just, you'll save the file. I'm replacing the one that I already have because that one actually contained the solution to the problem. Okay, so up to this point, do we have any questions? You set up a, an environment where you can write and debug C code. You download the template, okay? This is already done, or most of the code is already done. You only have to complete one of the functions in this particular program. So the next paragraph describes you know, what you should do. Your code should take the struct float 102 pointed to by parameter pn and preserve the value being represented uh, which is the coefficient times 2 to the power of e2 times 10 to the power of e10. The restrictions are as follows. Okay, so before we talk about you know, the restrictions, let's go ahead and take a look at the source file, and we'll upload it to um, online GDB, and we'll just kind of go through a few things, you know, just so that you know how to use online GDB. If you do not plan to use online GDB and you want to use VS Code and you already know how to do it, you can kind of ignore this particular part of the discussion. The nice thing about online GDB is you can do it on any computer. Um, if you set up an account, you can even quote unquote save your file you know, remotely. You know, it's stored in the cloud. So that means you, know, you can use a you know, lab computer here you know, to work on it, and then you can move, you, know, you can get back home and then use your home computer to continue the program that is actually stored on, you know, at online GDB. So I find that to be really convenient. And as I said, you know, earlier, Replit can do the same thing, except your know, Replit, as far as I can tell, does not provide a 
uh, really ex uh, really extensive debugging environment, which I think is going to be helpful, you know, in homework assignments like this. So that's your choice, okay? That is definitely your choice. All right, so the first thing I do is I would need to copy and paste from this file that I just downloaded, you know, onto online GDB. So online GDB, let me see right here, um, you can sign in, okay? So right now I have not signed in yet. And I can also probably use F12 to maximize the screen. Nope, that's not F12, like F11. Huh? Using Replit for two? Um, if you're more familiar with Replit, you know, that would work as well. The only difference is online GDB has a, um, it gives you GDB, you know, a direct interface to work with the debugger. I'm not sure about Replit. I tried it several times on Replit to try to use a debugger, and I could not figure out how to do it. So that's the only difference. If you don't, if you don't think you need a debugger, no problem. If you think you need a debugger, I like. I think online GDB is a better platform to do it. All right. So this is the code that it gives you, and I have not signed in yet. So let me see where I need to go to sign in. Sign in using Google Plus. Okay. So there you go. And I think I use my personal account, so let me see if that works. Um, oh, not upgrading. Uh, so go to create new project. And you want to choose the programming language. You can choose either one, okay? You know, both C or C++ will work, and all the versions of C++ will work as well. So that means the first five options will work. I'm suspecting the next two will work too, but you know, don't push your luck, okay? You know, because Turbo C is something from like a long time ago. Um, there's no need to go for you know, C and C++ in Turbo C. I would just go for C, okay? You know, personally, that's my choice, but if you want to go, if you want to use C out for debugging purposes, which I highly, I, I don't think it's the best way to, dis to debug a program, but if that is your way of debugging a program, then you can go ahead and choose C++ so you can use C in, C out, and all the other things that you're familiar with in C++. I just use you know, C, regular C, like so. All right, so next thing is I need to copy and paste the code. So I need to, oh, okay. That also hides all the tabs <clears throat> because I need to go back to, um, actually, I don't need the tabs anymore. What I do need is to copy and paste the file. So if I go to the temp folder, I can show you what the file looks like, you know, from a, just a regular you know, editor. It's a monolith.c. So this is the source file that is provided to you. You know, it is not really that long. It is 163 lines long. It has already implemented the parsing of a base 10 scientific notation, which basically means you don't have to worry about that part. Okay, the base 10 scientific notation parsing part is already done to done for you. The only thing you do have to do is to implement this function. This function is empty. It is defined, but there's no body to that function. I will show you a little bit later. <clears throat> so the next thing I need to do, you don't you don't have to do this you know, when you're working on the PC. So if you do this on the PC, what you need to do is to use Notepad. Okay, just use Notepad to open the file monolith.c. Control A, Control C, you know, select all, copy, go to the browser, Control V, paste it in, and you're all good to go. Okay? So in my case, I can do something like that, okay? You know, except I don't have mouse, uh, notepad, I have mouse pad. So I would do the same thing or something very similar here, just to show you what you can do with notepad. So this is the editor, Control A, Control C, and then you switch to online GDB if that is what you choose to use. Uh, select all over here, and then just you know, do a control V to paste over the existing content, and voila, now we have the file uploaded onto online GDB. So I'm gonna pause here a little bit and see if there are any questions about what I just did. Any questions? And I'm double checking to make sure that the reporter is on. Okay, so this way, yep, it's on. The audio is good. Audio, the video is good as well. So everything up to here 
are recorded. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So then what do we do next, right? Okay, so we continue to read the instructions. So we go back to the instructions, which is right here. All right, so um, it gives you a bunch of your restrictions, but it also gives you some instructions of how to run, uh, how to utilize online GDB. So the first thing it says is to put a breakpoint at the end of E10 to E2. Basically, you know, we are trying to um, turn the exponent of 10 to zero and adjust the coefficient and also the exponent of two accordingly. So that means, you know, we want to locate the function first and then put a breakpoint at the end of that function. So let me do that over here. And by the way, you know, once you sign in, you know, like what, what I just did, um, you can now uh, save the file because I just created a project. So when I click save right here, um, oh, okay, I guess, you know, I did not actually sign in earlier. So let me sign in first. And I can now give the project a name. We'll call this um, negative exponent. Okay, save. So now this project is, oh, this is the other project. Oh, never mind. Close this tab. This is the one that I want to save. Sorry, I, I click on the wrong tab. So this one I already signed in. So I just need to say this is my negative exponent uh, project. You can name yours however you want to. Okay, it doesn't matter how you name yours. All right. So the next thing we need to do is to find uh, the function that is called e10 to e2. Um, which is you know, basically this name here. So you just have to search in here, or you can just kind of browse, and it's right here. It's right above main with a bunch of other you know, pound includes. The way you set a breakpoint here is just to click on the line number to the left-hand side. So that would set a breakpoint. So the little red circle is telling you that I have just set up a breakpoint at the end of the function of e10 to e2. All right, so I'm going to pause here because I just introduced a term that some of you may not have encountered. Does everybody understand what is a breakpoint? Did I debug? Yep. It stops executing after that point? It pauses execution. So there's a big difference between stopping and pausing because if it's just pausing the execution, that means you can continue after you do a bunch of stuff. If it has stopped, you know, then the whole thing has stopped. You cannot you know, continue or resume execution. Is that okay? All right, so it's important to differentiate between stopping and pausing, and the breakpoint is pausing your know, execution. It just put it, puts it on hold for a little bit. Okay, next thing is we want to debug the program and not to run the program, okay? So if you run the program, it's not gonna do anything because you need to supply um, you know, two command line you know, components in order for this to work. So we go to debug, so when we debug, it would actually compile the code, and I can maximize the screen again just to, oh, come on, that's the left. No. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I'm just maximizing the screen so that we can see more of the debugger. You can also change the bar. You know, this is draggable, which means when you're debugging a program, you can actually put, you know, allocate more resources to the debugger than you know, the uh, listing of the program. So the way you run this program is not just to type run, okay? So let me move here. Okay, so the way you run the program is to say run, you know, which is just R, or you can spell out run, okay? Either way is fine. Um, but you have to also specify dash N, you know, basically it's a switch on the command line, and then give it something to process. So in this case, I'm gonna specify 1.23E negative 45. In other words, I am specifying a base 10 scientific notation with a negative uh, exponent for 10 um, to as a beginning point. Is that part okay? So this is where it gets a little bit tricky if you want to use VS Code, because in VS Code, I think all of you know how to run a program without these command line you know, um, arguments, but you have to learn, okay? You know, if you want to work with this program, you have to learn how to do this in VS Code, and also Replit, and also the other tools. I know how to do this in code blocks, okay, you know, and obviously I know how to do this um, in GDB, you know, so you can run GDB on the command line if that is how you want to set it up too, but you have to find a way to supply the two command line arguments, 
one is dash n, the other one is one, you know, whatever number you want it to process. So once I do this, I can press the enter key, which you know, executes this command. Um, let me do it one more time. There we go. So right now, um, you can see how the line where the breakpoint is, is quote unquote highlighted. You know, it puts a kind of green box around that line. So that means we are now at a breakpoint. <coughs> the program has paused execution on line 126 right now. So the other thing you might notice is on the right hand side, it gives you, you know, quite a few useful information, pieces of information. The first one is called the call stack, which is also called the backtrace, backtrace window. It is not particularly helpful in this program, okay? But if you are taking some other classes like CISP 430, 400, and so on and so forth, um, that traceback or callback, your know, stack can be very helpful because it tells you how you got to the breakpoint. Um, <laughs> I talk too much. <clears throat> So that's okay, we can you know, do the whole thing again. <sighs> okay, so run dash and 1.23 E negative 45. Okay, so I just have to keep doing stuff, you know, so that it doesn't time out on me, you know, because, you know, if I just keep talking, it times out. So right here, it tells me that main calls E2, E10 to E2. So that's why, that's what is displaying here. This particular window is really helpful when you are debugging recursive subroutines, because it will tell you the function calls itself, then calls itself, then calls itself, so it can actually at least visualize how many times you know, the recursion has happened, and you know, it's, a, it's a really great tool for debugging programs. Um, and then it will also tell you if, if you have any local variables, it will also show up here, but since you know, this function is empty right now, it has no local variables. It does have a parameter, called PN, and in this case, PN is a pointer to a struct float 102. So one thing you might want to do is really just to say, tell me what is PN, okay? So the command is print PN. You, know, you might want to look at this screen because you know, this screen has, you know, for many of you, it's blocked by my monitor here. Um, can everybody see the command line out output? Because if you cannot, I can probably make the window smaller and just drag it up so you can see it. Are we okay or not? We good? Okay. So print PN, and all it's gonna tell you is, oh, uh, it is a pointer to a struct your float 102, and this is the address, which is not really helpful, because I want to know what is inside the structure. So instead of doing this, I can say, okay, show me what it is point, what is at that location. So now it becomes more helpful, because now it's telling me that we have four members in this particular structure, Member S, which is the side bit, is a zero. Member co, co N, okay, you know, which is the coefficient, is 123. Member E10, which is the exponent of 10, is negative 47. And then E2, which is our exponent in base two, is currently zero. Are we okay so far? Does everybody see how the structure is really reflecting the value that I want to process? which is, you know, in base 10 scientific notation, it's 1.23 times 10 to the power of negative 45. Good so far? All right. So the code is not written yet. So at this point, the program doesn't do a single thing. If I just click continue or type C, you know, which is the same thing as continue, it would just kind of finish the execution, and that's the end of the debug session. So, you know, when the program is done, you know, it will go to... Uh, it will tell you in theory of one, I have no idea why that is the case, but it will also confirm that it has exited normally. So when you see exited normally, it means the program has stopped execution. It's done. Are we good so far? Okay. So this is how, you know, you would use, if you choose to use online GDB, this is how you can work with online GDB. Um, the print can print a lot of stuff, okay? You can even ask you to print, you know, like an expression that involves your calculations and whatnot. So it's a really useful tool for debugging. <clears throat> it doesn't look easy to use, okay? But it is actually quite powerful. So for those of you who are thinking, okay, I want to use, you know, GDB, but I have never heard of GDB before this class, and I have no idea how to use it. So how do you do it? 
Google search. <laughs> so Google search or ask Chat GPT. How do I use you know uh, GDB? Uh, so you can look up tutorial if you just go for a Google search um, tutorial of how to use GDB, and you will find plenty. Okay, because GDB is a program that many universities you know, would use in their undergraduate programs. So you will find tutorials intended for undergraduate computer science you know, people from various universities of how to get do the basics of GDB. Are we good so far? Yes? Okay. So if anyone is getting bothered by me just going like, okay, look up this resource and you can learn how to use this tool, I'll just share a story. When I was taking um, operating system, you know, which is not the same as the operating system class here. So the operating system class at a four-year university is about the internal working and also the programming of an operating system and not about you know, how to use an operating system from the user's point of view. So at the, in the first class, okay, the teacher, you know, the professor just said, oh, by the way, since you guys only know your know, Pascal up to this point, we're gonna do everything here in C. You have about two weeks to learn it. Okay. In other words, your entire CISP 360, your entire CISP 400 is combined to two weeks. You got two weeks to learn this new programming language and we'll be using it to do the projects for this class. Good luck. And then the professor went on to talk about just operating system concepts. You just learn the language by yourself. So that's how things used to be in 1986. And there, and there was also no internet either, okay? The only way you can communicate, quote unquote, remotely with somebody else is to get a modem, a 300 bit per second you know, modem where you, know, you can actually read faster than the modem can communicate. You can connect to a local BBS or bulletin board service and you can chat with people, you know, and that's about all the online resources you're gonna get back in 1986. Yes, I am quite old because in 1986, I was already in university, in college. All right, so getting back to this, yes. <clears throat> All right, so what, we, what you need to do, okay, is to observe the restrictions, the resulting coefficient, which I call co-f, you know, in, as a member of the structure, which and I also only use c, you know, in the equation because it's a whole lot easier to type just c. The condition is twice of that has to be greater than two to the power 64 minus one, which turns out to be the largest value that you can store to a 64 bit unsigned integer. Okay. Now, this particular value is also special because, okay, let me point out which value we are talking about. I'm talking about two to the power of 64 minus one because there is a macro, that's a symbolic name defined inside standard integer dot h that will give you exactly that amount. So you don't have to specify you know, and do your own calculation to figure out what it looks like. Okay, so I see some frowning, okay, which means I can elaborate a little bit. So if you look up your know, uh, standard integer dot h, okay, which is the header file, and you know, just looking up the name will give you a bunch of uh, information already. So you click on the first one, and then you want to find what is the largest value a 64-bit unsigned integer can represent. So you pretty much have to read through this a little bit, okay? And keep going, keep going, keep going, and then, you know, or if you're lazy like me, you just search for max, okay? So you search for max, and then you go like, hmm, okay, the following type designate, blah, 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 okay, that doesn't seem to be Particularly helpful, so you keep going, keep going. Um, the following macros specify the maximum and minimum limit of the type declared in the standard integer dot, integer dot h, you know, int standard integer dot h file. Each macro name, macro name correspond to a similar type name in integer types, blah, 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 blah. And oh, okay, that looks like something that we might be interested in. Maximum value of exact width, you know, unsigned integer types. Wait, what is uint64 underscore t? 
there's an unsigned 64-bit integer. So I will leave it up to you to find out how to use this clue here. Okay? There's a reason, okay, before I could move on any further, there's a reason why this N here is italicized. And so is this N here, why it is italicized. So you want to figure out, you know, how to specify that macro, okay? I will leave it up to you guys to determine that. <clears throat> All right, so does that answer the question, even though nobody really asked the question, but I saw a few frowns? Are we, are we good here? Maybe. Um, so that you don't have to do your own calculation. Because otherwise, you're going to have to find out what is 2 to the power of 64 minus 1, which is an 19-digit base 10 number. And then you have to type that number in because if that is the limit of, that you need to use to form a bunch of comparisons. So if you feel like, you know, but I really like that challenge. I like to type 19 digits in every single time because I don't want to refer to the maximum value of an unsigned 64-bit integer. Be my guest, okay? Your program will still work, but you still need to know how to do it, okay? Because I can tell you, it's tricky to specify that to a constant because when you specify a literal constant, it automatically has a type of integer and not unsigned integer. So I'll just say, this is an easy way to do it. But if you want to give yourself a challenge, you can try to do it as a literal constant. And I'm going to tell you, it will take a little bit more uh, work to get it to work. It will work. It's just not easy. Not as easy. Okay, so getting back to here. Okay, second restriction is E10 as a member should be zero when your algorithm is done. E2 as a member can be any integer. It is signed, so that means E2 can be positive. It can also go negative depending on you know, the situation. The represented value V should be preserved as much as possible. In other words, when we look at uh, the coefficient times 2 to the power of E2 times 10 to the power of E10, this value should not change much. Is it going to change? The answer is, yeah, just a little bit, okay? But it should not be a whole lot, okay? Do we have any questions about that statement? That V is going to change a little bit, you know, just because you know, when you do a division by 10, you're going to lose some precision, but we don't want to lose any more than necessary. So V should be preserved as much as possible. Um, your entire program should not use anything that relies on float, double, or functions from math.h. So no call to round, no call to floor, no call to pow, which is power, no call to log, and that kind of stuff. Your entire program should only use integer types and integer operations. So that is a restriction that I'm going to look for, okay? Because in past years, some people go like, oh, okay, that's pretty easy to do. I just have to take the log of this and da, 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 da. Nope, you cannot use log. Um, you also need to comment your code, okay? So you need to explain to me what your code is doing. You know, what? why are you setting up this loop? Why is that the condition of the loop and so on? So that explains all the restrictions. Um, and then to submit, you know, Turn in the entire source code file and not, not just the function that you're completing. Um, so the next question is, um, so how do I know my program is working correctly? Okay, because that's probably a very legitimate question. So I'm giving you a log file, just like I give you the log file for the other homework assignments. So we'll take a look at this log file and see what it looks like. So once again, you know, when you get here, do a right click and then do a click save link as. Um, nope, I click on the wrong thing. So you have to go to the down arrow thing, save link as. Yep, so this one is correct. It asks you about you know, what file name you want to save it as. The default is sample-1.log, so it is actually the correct one. Okay. So now I'm going to show you what it looks like. I will show you what um, that particular file looks like. So let me do an end vim on sample1.log. So this is what it looks like. It's basically telling you um, how the coefficient is getting changed and how E2 is getting changed. And then once in a while, OK, 
okay? E10 is going to get changed too. But E10 doesn't get changed until up to this point. So until E2 go all the way to mm -hmm. negative 57, then we have the coefficient you know, being changed from the previous one, previous one in a very subtle way, but it's actually a major, major way. And then E10 gets incremented from negative 47 to negative 46. So this log is telling you what your code should also be doing when you use 1.23 E negative 45 as the sample input. Okay, I'm going to pause here because I think there might be a few questions at this point of how to use the log file. Are there any questions? So what this log file is trying to tell you is as your code executes, you might want to check that your coefficient and your E2 are changing in the same way as in this log file. Because if your program is not doing similar changes to the coefficient or E2 or E10, there might be something incorrect about the logic in your code. Yes? If you want to change things, you want to use that um, How you want to utilize it is up to you. So the best way to do it, you know, using that website, is you can, you can use C out if you want to, but then you have to dig through a lot of stuff. So one way to do it you know, with this particular resource is you know, in your own code here. So I'm going to show you some incorrect code, OK? So do not copy this because it's not going to be useful, OK? So I'm just going to say, uh, let's just you know, decrement um, E10, OK? Which is totally incorrect, but I just want to show you, you know, how to debug your code and how to utilize um, the debugger combined with the log file. So what I would do is I'm going to move the breakpoint. So if you click on an existing breakpoint, it's going to toggle it. If it's already here, it goes away. If there's nothing here, it will appear. Okay. So now I'm you know, putting a breakpoint here, and I'm going to debug the program. Okay. So I will use the same thing, which is run <clears throat> uh, dash n 1.23 e negative 45. So if you're really checking your program against the log file, make sure that you use this particular value for checking because you know, the log file is generated using this particular test case. Now, if you want different test cases you know, to kind of cross-check things, I can generate additional log files for different test cases if that is what you want. But right now, we only have you know, the uh, log for this one. So I run the code. Okay. Come on. Okay, just press the Enter key. So now we have a green box here you know, surrounding line 148, which means we're not at a breakpoint. So this is also something that you might want to remember, is when you're on a breakpoint, that line has not executed yet. In other words, right now, E10 is still 50, negative 57, not negative uh, 58. So how do I know? Well, all you have to do is to say print, okay? Print what is the E10 member of the structure the PN is pointing to. So I know that sounds like a mouthful, but that's basically what it is. PN and then pointing to E10, excuse me, PN arrow point to E10 is basically referring to the member E10 of the structure the PN is pointing to. So if those concepts, you know, if those words sounds a little bit foreign or green to you, you probably need to review uh, those particular C concepts because pointers and structures should have been covered in CISP 360. All right. So press the enter key. It is negative 47 right now. So now I don't want to continue the execution of the program. Instead, I want a single step. So the single step, you can do one of two things. You can either use the convenient way here, which is uh, to step over or step into. The difference between stepping over and stepping into only matters when you're writing your own subroutine that you can trace into, because you know, what step into is going to do is if you're calling a subroutine, then you will stop on the first line of the subroutine. Stepping over means, okay, I'm going to assume this function is correct, okay? So don't pause execution until we are done with the subroutine that I'm calling right now. Does everybody understand the difference between stepping into versus stepping over? 
So stepping into will not execute whatever function, subroutine, et cetera, that is being called on the next line. It will execute, but it will stop on the first line of the called subroutine. That's what I said. Oh, okay. Step over runs the entire thing and then stops? Yes. Okay. Pause. Yep. And then pause. Yep. Okay. Yeah, pause. Sorry. <laughs> Get me. Yes, I, I'm nitpicking. Stop. I'm nitpicking a little bit here because you know there is a difference in this context. Right. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to use single stepping. Uh, stepping. It doesn't make a difference in this case because this is not a function call. So as long as you're not making a function call, stepping over versus versus stepping into, they do not make a difference. So in this context, you can choose either one. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. So I, I'm just going to single step, okay? Stepping, basically, step is stepping over. But that, actually, that's stepping into. So now I'm done. It looks like we are still on the same line, but that's because this is an infinite loop, and it does not stop at the condition of the while loop. That's one of the um, little, you know, one of the problems with uh, GDB or the way it sets a breakpoint is you cannot really stop you know, when it's evaluating the condition. But now, if I say print, you know, PN points to E10 again, it shows me negative 48. So this is how we can check the execution of your code and find out, you know, how it is changing um, the various members of the structure the PN is pointing to. Now, for those of you who don't want to use GDB like this, you can also use your C out. The problem of using C out is you end up with just a bunch of your output, and then you don't know which output is generated by which line because there might be multiple places that you want to say, okay, I want to know, you know, how uh, E2 is being changed here, or I want to know how the position is changed over here. So you could, you're going to need a lot of C out, you know, and it's, it, it's just a little bit harder to go through from my perspective, but it's up to you to decide how you want to do this. Are we good so far? There are other things you can do too. You know, there are more advanced feature of GDB that might be helpful. One particular concept that might be helpful in this case is the, the watch point you know, um, construct. So watch is not on a line by line basis. You're not telling GDB to stop on a particular line. You're telling GDB to stop when something, an expression changes its value. So that can be helpful because you can say, hey, if anything inside the structure, the PN is changing, stop execution because I want to take a look. So it will not only stop, but it will also show you what is being changed. Okay, I can illustrate. So hopefully the session is not has not timed out yet. Okay, has not. Nice. Okay, so I can say watch, and then you have to give it an expression to watch. So in this case, I'm saying you know, watch whatever PN is pointing to. Press the enter key. Now I can say continue execution. I don't need the breakpoint anymore at this point. So I can I can remove the breakpoint because anytime I change anything, okay, let me pull the, the bar up a little bit so you can see a little bit better. So anytime I change anything that PN is pointing to, it will automatically say the old value is blah, blah, and the new value is blah, blah. Unfortunately, it doesn't do the highlighting, but when you only have four members, it's easy enough just to compare you know, what is in the old value and what is in the new value. So you can see that it just you know, changed from negative 48 in E10 to negative 49 in E2 to E10. So that's another thing you can also do when you want to use uh, debugging. Um, okay, one more thing. You know, for those of you who really want to kind of make this debugging process efficient is GDB conditional watch. So that's a much more advanced you know, concept. And it may not be able to do conditional watch points, but it can do conditional breakpoints, which means you know, until a condition is satisfied, even though there is a breakpoint, don't stop. Okay, you know, keep going until this condition is true at this line, then stop and so I can examine stuff. So there are, because there are certain times where you go like, okay, I can see how the, where this is going. It keeps going, 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 going. I don't want to keep, you know, continue, continue, continue. I just want to say, okay, keep continuing automatically until this condition is true. 
So that way, you know, the breakpoint will only become active, it will only pause execution when a particular condition is true. So those are slightly more advanced, you know, concepts when it comes to using GDB, um, but at the same time, um, it can also improve your efficiency as you are, you know, debugging your program. So there we go. So GDB is really quite um, useful, and there are other ways to script your GDB as well. So in other words, you know, if you go through a certain process to test your program, and it's every single time it's the same process, um, the GDB can take your script files, which basically means you, know, you, can write, you can write your own scripts to automate the debugging process. Okay. But those are like way advanced topics. You know, I'm not expecting people in this class to, you know, to, to do that. Uh, but you know, as you use GDB more, you know, as you transfer to a four-year university and you find that, oh, okay, I might want to look into how to automate certain things in GDB, you can actually look into that. It's actually quite interesting. It's, uh, GDB has its own scripting language, which can have functions, uh, conditional statements, loops, and so on. So it's actually pretty cool. All right, so that pretty much describes you know, what you need to do for the next week. So unlike a typical lab, this one is not due today. This one is due, um, let me go back and check the due date. This is due one week from today. So it's due right before class starts next Thursday. So you got a week to work on this, all right? So what is your plan? Procrastinate until next Wednesday at 9 p.m. <laughs> then I'll start to work on this because I'm pretty sure I can do this then in 15 minutes or less. So don't wait, okay? You know, <laughs> start early because you know we still have one more class meeting on next Tuesday. So if you have any questions. You know, you can bring up those questions on next Tuesday, or you can come visit my office hour as well. Okay, you know, I'll be more than happy to kind of give you some pointers if you run into, you know, some kind of bug that you cannot resolve. Yep. Can we reach out via email as well? Hmm? Can we reach out via email as well? Yes. But my standard uh, time frame of communication still applies, which means it's within 24 hours. Right. This is partially why I don't run my own Discord server anymore for my classes. <laughs> I don't want those things, you know, like every every two minutes, you know, at 2 a.m. in the morning, right before the homework is due. You would laugh because, you know, that's exactly what I got during the pandemic. <laughs> I'm not laughing, like, because I don't think it is. I'm laughing because I know you did. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So email is a little bit more removed, so I can go, like, I'm going to check my email now. <clears throat> as opposed to, oh, Discord. Oh, it's coming from my class. <laughs> All right. So do we get a basic idea of how to do this? Okay. All right. All right. So we are, okay. So I'm going to take a roll, you know, now, um, just so that we have a little transition. Transitioning, as it turns out, is uh, can be very difficult for some people, especially people with ADHD. Um, one of the hard, difficult things, or one of the challenges of people with ADHD, is transitioning. Um, you know, I was reading this article. I have, you know, probably a little bit of ADHD, but not to the point where, you know, I can. The article said, you know, this person, you know, the the writer, uh, would go, you know, uh, grocery shopping. You know, would go to the supermarket, you know, buy the you know, grocery, and then when she gets back home, she had to sit on the driveway for half an hour before you know, getting ready to get back into the house. Even that transition is challenging. I don't have a problem with that. You know, the moment I get home, I want to get all the grocery out because I want to eat. I want to start cooking and eat. So, all right. So this is the negative exponent, which is corresponding to section 5.2.1 of the module. Okay, so you know, the logic is all there already. But you kind of have to figure out you know, how to get it to work. Okay? All right. So, what we are going to do next is to get into von Neumann architecture and memory. This is a whole new module. You can see that you know, I do not break up the modules like some of, some of your other classes. This is 
this has been a really, really, really long, long module. Because this entire module has to do with how do we represent data, okay? How do we represent values? What are numbers, okay? We got signed versus unsigned representation. How do we work with these numbers? How do we add? How do we subtract? How do we compare, okay? How do we take the arithmetic negation when we have a signed representation? How do we represent things that are not even integers? How do we represent pi and so on, okay? So that has been the focus up to this point. The next module, okay, I'm transitioning. Oh, I remember now, I was about to take road, wasn't I? Yep, and it's right here. There we go. So the road taking activity should be visible now. You can re refresh your browser. And then the access code is online GDB. I'm not sure whether this is going to be helpful, but I'm going to write it here, online GDB. <clears throat> so go ahead and get this done. You have until 10.15 to do it, so there's plenty of time to do it. And I wrote it on the whiteboard, which means, you know, if you don't feel like doing it right now, you can kind of wait a little bit, but make sure you do it before 10.15. All right, so for those of you who are done with the road-taking activity, and you might still have a question of, so why is it called GDB, okay? What does the G stand for, and why is it called GD? Uh, GNU, GNU. Yep, GNU. Debugger. Debugger, that's it, okay. So then the next question, the follow-up question is, what is GNU? Oh, this is, this is a fun one. I've seen it used in regards to Linux, but I'm not actually sure what it means. Because nobody does. Because no, nobody does, nobody knows what GNU actually means because of its definition. GNU means GNU is not Unix. That's all it stands for. You can even look it up. I did not make this up, okay? I'm not smart enough to make this up. GNU is not Unix. That is, okay, so there you, there you go, right here. GNU is a recursive acronym for GNU is not GNU's not Unix, uh, chosen because Un uh, GNU's design is Unix-like, but differs from Unix by being free software and containing no Unix code. In other words, the original Unix, okay, which was a product of uh, Bell Labs from at and that was invented in the early 70s. So they were the first one who came up with the Unix operating system and all the command line stuff, you know, the compiler and whatnot. The GNU project was basically saying, uh, we want to do the same thing, but we don't want to reuse the code base for copyright purposes. So they were replicating everything that Unix had, and you know, the GNU project was basically a replication of everything that Unix has. Um, so that's why we have uh, GNU. And then Linux came along, you know, because you know, Linux is also uh, Unix, inspired, but it is, it's an entirely different code base, so there's no licensing issue, because Unix technically is copyrighted by uh, at and and there's another version that is copyrighted by Berkeley, and hence the name BSD, Berkeley Standard Distribution. You guys looking at me and go like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. How does this have anything to do with my daily life? Easy, easy peasy. If you use iOS, that's a BSD, okay? You're at the core of, uh, of your iOS, your operating system on your Apple mobile devices, it is Unix. At the core of Mac OS, it is also Unix, okay? So most people do not know that because Apple really tried their best not to let people know. <laughs> All right. Since most people are now done with the road taking activity, we are now getting back to the von Neumann architecture. And given the time frame today, I may not be able to get into a whole lot of specifics, but I can at least go over a few things, like the overarching stuff. First of all, what is his name? You know, what is von Neumann? I mean, you know, 
Does anyone know? Okay. So when we don't know something, what do we do? We Google search, okay? And you know, 10 years from here, you know, from now, people would not say Google anymore. They would go like GPT it, or you know, have some kind of you know, branded AI engine, and they would just ask the AI engine, what is this? All right, so we're gonna look up um, Voin Neumann. And then this picture comes up, okay? This is one of the important people in computer science. And we're gonna look up the Wikipedia page. So obviously, you know, this is related, but not gonna be you know, in your next exam, okay? Of you know, who's John von Neumann, but we want to know how he contributes to computer science. So before von Neumann, who is also considered one of the major figures in computer science, that was Alan Turing, okay? You know, how many people know who, who is Alan Turing? Really? And this is a computer science class? <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, an English class where no one knows where England is. Okay, so it's important, okay? Look up who is Alan Turing because he is the father of computer science, okay? He is the reason why we are where we are now in terms of, you know, computers, you know, computing equipment and that kind of stuff. But this is, this guy here, you know, John von Neumann, is the other reason why we are where we are now. So he is, his contribution to STEM includes a lot of stuff. So, you know, you can see the long list of what he can do. He is a mathematician, physicist, computer scientist, engineer, and a polymath. And what he's good at includes you know, math, physics, economics, computing, statistics, and so on. And the most fascinating thing about the John von Neumann is if you ask any expert in any of these particular fields, they will tell you that John von Neumann is the guy, okay, at least in that era, of that specific field. In other words, he's not jack of all, you know, all trade and master of none. He is a jack of all trade and master in every single field that he is a master of. Um, he is a um, jack of, jack of, yeah. So that's kind of interesting, but the guy did not live too long. Uh, he passed away when he was in his 50s. So you can check out his, uh, his age. Let's see, where is it? Okay, there we go. So he was born 1903. He passed away in 1957. So he was only 53 at the time that he passed away. And I'm older than that, okay? One of the reasons why people, you know, one of the speculation of why he passed away so early was because he was involved in the uh, invention of the hydrogen bomb as well as the nuclear bomb. So he, you know, people think that he might have been exposed to radiation, and as a result, you know, he probably died from cancer. But back then, people did not know as much about radiation, poison, and stuff like that. Anyway, fascinating story to read if you want to know the other background. Uh, he also taught at Princeton University, and he overlapped with I, uh, Albert Einstein, which is kind of interesting because these two are entirely opposite people. Uh, Albert Einstein was an introvert. He preferred to work in a quiet you know, environment by himself. And John von Neumann is an extroverted person. He enjoys polka music. So you can kind of imagine, you know, one introvert, one extrovert, one prefers, you know, I just need a quiet environment to work on my stuff. The other one's like, I cannot think unless I play this polka music along the same hallway in Princeton University. So, fascinating stuff. I can see a movie coming to talk about these two. Anyway, so the John von Neumann, Neumann architecture before, so the, the most important part is to think about what, what computers are like before John von Neumann and what it is like after John von Neumann, okay? So before John von Neumann, um, computers, are hardwired, okay? Let me show you a hardwired computer. 
So we can look up. Uh, I think the Colossus, Colossus is a is one of those computers. So let me look it up. Uh, computer Colossus. How do you spell Colossus? Yep. There we go. All right. And we can take a look at one of these pictures. So we go to here, click on that, and see, can we make this bigger without paying? I guess that's good enough. OK, so this is the Colossus your computer you know, back in 1943. Um, the way you program it, the way you specify how it gets the job done is by wiring. I literally means wiring, like you know how to connect from one point of the circuit to another point of the circuit. Okay. In other words, it is hard coded in every sense of the word. So the question is, what if you want to change the behavior of the program? What if you want the program to change and go like, oh, I want to put in this conditional thing. If this value is less than that value, I want to go here and instead you know, go in there. You literally have to undo a whole lot of wiring and then rewire the computer. Is that OK? All right. Does everybody understand when I said you know, I'll be OK, I mean, I meant you know, do we understand what it entails when people say, oh, I just have to reprogram you know, the, the computer? OK, so I will give you a picture of what wiring looks like. So I, I can give you a, a relatively modern picture of your wire wrapping. So wire wrapped computer. And we look, go through the images and we look for a particular picture like this one. There we go. So this is a relatively simple design. <laughs> and each wire, each thing that's poking out of the circuit board is called a post. And then the, the posts are not connected to each other in any way. So what you need to do if you want to say, oh, I want this you know, to connect to the thing somewhere over here. You can see kind of the wire here. So you basically use a very thin wire. I believe those are the you know, uh, 38 WG, you know, 30 gauge you know, wire. So the, the, the end of the wire is straight. So it has no insulator. And then you, there's a special tool to put the wire in, and then you twist the tool to wrap the conductor part of the wire around the post. And then you take the wire to where it's supposed to go and do the same thing on the other end. That's how you make a single connection between two points of the circuit. Okay? So when you're reprogramming, quote unquote, reprogramming a computer, what it entails is undoing a bunch of these your wires and then redo you know, the new wiring. If you make a mistake, you kind of have to figure out where the mistake is. There's no debugger whatsoever, OK? The computer just won't do what you think it should be doing. So that was how computers were programmed, quote, unquote, programmed before born doing time. Now, but even computers that were, quote, unquote, programmed using wire wrapping, you know, just to have direct wire connections, they had memory already. Because in order to do calculations, because one of the applications of the earliest you know, computers is to calculate the trajectory of, I think those are the words, naval shells, okay, you know, fire from battleships, because they need to figure out, okay, if I have this elevation angle and in this temperature, this kind of air density, uh, what is the trajectory of the projectile? So the earlier computers were used for that purpose. But even for those purposes, you still need to keep track of uh, what is the current velocity, uh, what is the um, drag of the air, and so on and so forth. So they had memory already. But the memory were used only to store data. In other words, if you think about your C programs, only the variables were stored in the memory, but the entire program, all your conditional statements, the for loops, you know, the functions and whatnot, they were all hardwired. So imagine your program like that, okay? So what is John von Neumann's contribution? So let's go back to the John von Neumann picture. Okay, so we have the, the right context. All right, so John von, von his, his contribution, so I'm going to look up architecture here. There we go. 
So his contribution was, what about this? We don't change the wiring anymore. Instead, we'll use the computer's memory to store the instructions, to specify what the computer is supposed to do. That was his contribution. To us, it sounds like that's pretty natural. That's how we do things. Well, it's natural. That's how we do things because of him. Because before John von John von Neumann, everything was hardwired. So that one simple concept, what seems to be simple to us, because you know, we are we have been using it for so long, was actually a big game changer. Because now, by only changing the content of memory locations, you can now change the behavior of the computer. There's no need to open up the computer and do any type of rewiring. All you have to do is quote unquote, well, okay, quote unquote, all you have to do is to change the content of memory of your computer. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, um, the contribution of John von Neumann in terms of computer architecture? Okay, so I'll do, I'll say, I'll say, one, I'll say that one more time. His contribution is the concept of using the computer's memory to store instructions. And the instructions will basically determine what the computer can do. So when you want to change the behavior of a computer, there's no need to open it up. There's no need to undo the wiring. There's no need to redo the wiring. You just change the content of memory. Now, I do want to put you know, changing the content of the memory in quotes because you know, that was not easy you know, in the earlier days either. So to understand that part, um, there is a particular computer in the earlier days where it will demonstrate how you change the content of memory, but I cannot remember the name of that computer. Um, okay, I'm just gonna search for it then. Computer change memory content using switches. And we'll look up uh, images because that's the quickest way for visual people to find it. Um, nope, nope, nope. I just cannot remember the name of that computer. But anyway, the um, the concept of changing the content at a location using only switches is really not that easy. Just imagine that. Okay, um, we'll, we'll just use a very simple example. You have a computer that has 256 bytes of content. Okay, that's a pretty tiny little computer. So what you do is you have eight switches to control the address. So you flip those eight switches to specify what location. And then you have another bank of eight switches to specify what content, what is the byte content to go into that location. And then you have a little toggle on the side, go like, store now. And then you go back and you change the address to the next one, re-specify the content of the next address, toggle. That is how you program a computer byte by byte. Well, some time ago, okay, not now. So it was, it took a while to get to where we are now. I mean, most of you probably have your apps, you know, and also your entire operating system updated overnight without you having to, to do a single thing. You just have to configure your phone and go like, yes, I want to update you know, sometime between 2 and 4 a.m. And your phone automatically get, gets it done. So just want to kind of give you an idea of how far we have gone from the earlier days of computer science. Cool. I think it's cool. Um, so now the next question is, what is computer memory? How does a computer remember anything? Okay, that's the next question. So that's going to this particular slide here. And we have, we don't have a whole lot of time, you know, which means you know, I'm going to probably go back to this slide here and kind of re-examine some of the concepts over here. All right, so the first thing we need to talk about is an SR latch. But instead of giving you the circuit diagram in Robinson, I'm giving you a word description of the circuit, okay? So this has to do with um, 
C++, you know, this is basically borrowing concepts from C++. So we have NAND2 as a type or as a class. N1, N2 are variables of the type NAND2. Um, S and R are, are of the type of input pin. Q and NQ are of the type of output pin. So if we just look at the first three lines, do we have any questions understanding that the circuit has six components? If I were to draw this out in Logitech, it has six components. It has two NAND2 gates, two input pins, and then two output pins. Is that okay? All right. So the next thing is a little bit more confusing because we have to add a node to the circuit itself. So the question is, the first question is what is a node? So a node is a very specific term in circuit design. A node is basically a contiguous piece of conduct, uh, conductive material connecting multiple points together. That's basically what a node is. Yep. It relates to wiring, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to just one single wire. It corresponds to everything that is electrically connected to the same wire, to the same, you know, um, to the same node. Is that okay or not? Does everybody understand what a node is? Okay. So when we specify a node, this is also borrowed from C++ or Java, is we create a new node and then what we do with a new node is to specify what pin of the S and what pin of N1 are connected. Now the reason why your N or N1 dot in is an array is because it is a NAND2 gate. There are two input pins. So instead of just naming the input pins in zero in one, I just say, well, why don't we look at it as an array? Okay, so the in member of N1, which is a NAND2 gate, is an array of two specific pins. So what do we have here? Okay, let me go back to the the tablet. Okay, today we haven't used the tablet yet, so I need to get it started first. So let me get that started. And we can do it here. CTY dot switch. All right, so we need this. Here. Okay. So I'll show you the circuit. Okay, so we have um, two NAND gates, right? So this is N1, this is N2, and NAND gates has a little bubble over here because the output is negated. And then we have two outputs, okay? So the output pins are in circles. One is called Q, the other one is called NQ. We have two input pins, okay? One input pin is called S, the other one is called R. And the way they're connected, I'm not gonna go back to the word description here, but the way they're connected is actually pretty simple. Okay, so this part is pretty easy, which means you know, the R pin, you know, the input pin R is connected to one of the inputs of the N1 NAND gate, and then the R input pin is connected to one of the input pins of the N2 NAND gate. The output of N1 connects to Q as an output pin, the output of N2 connects to NQ as an output pin. What makes this circuit interesting is this part. You take the output of one of the NAND gate, it becomes the input of the other NAND gate, and the same thing over here. You take the output of one of the NAND gate, it turns into the one of the inputs of the other NAND gate. So now, this is the first time we see a circuit that has, quote unquote, a loop in it. But it really is not exactly a loop because it's not connecting back to the same gate, okay? It is connecting to the other gate, but indirectly, there is, quote unquote, a loop in it. So are we doing okay so far understanding the connectivity between the components of this uh, circuit here? Okay, so what we do is now we analyze the circuit, okay? So we say, um, what if S and R are both zeros? What is going to happen? So if S and R are both circles, uh, excuse me, both, both are zeros, what do you think is going to happen? How do we analyze this circuit? Well, with this one, it's easy to analyze because you have N1 and N2 being NAND gates, right? And what, why do we call those NAND gates? It's, a, it's an abbreviation of something. 
is a negated n. Very good. So that means you know, down below, okay, it is just a regular AND gate, but the output is negated. So if S is a zero, can we determine the output of N1 right away without even needing to know what the other input pin is? In other words, just knowing that the S pin is a zero, can we say you know, what the output of N1 is going to be? It's going to be a one, all right? I mean, we don't even need to think too much about it because it's the negated end. And if one side of an end is a zero, the whole end is going to be a zero. But since an end is negating the output, so it becomes a one. The same argument goes for NQ. It is also going to be a one. Oof, easy peasy. Any questions about this? Nope. Okay. So assuming this is where we start, okay, this is the, uh, the state where we are going to base on you know, to go to the next state. So what if the next state here is, okay, we'll keep the S pin to zero, but we'll change the R pin to a one. What do you think is going to happen in this case? So now it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to analyze because we know that Q continues to be a one, not a problem, right? Because you know, S is still a zero, so that means your know, N1 still has to output a one. That is not a problem. But the problem is R is now changing from a zero to a one. So this pin right here, this node was a one. It still is a one. But R, which used to be a zero, is now a one. So now N2 is getting two ones as the input. So what would be the new output of N2, which is basically NQ? It's going to turn into a zero. Very good. So Q maintains to be a one, and Q becomes a zero. Then we transition again, okay? And this time we're transitioning you know, S to a one, R maintaining to be a one. So what do you think is gonna happen this time? So this makes it a little bit harder to imagine or to visualize, and this is why we're gonna to change to a different tool to keep track of you know, how things are getting changed. So in this case, um, the only change is S, it, it went from a zero to a one. So we know this pin here, this output was a zero already. So that zero is still going here. And since you know, this pin here is a zero, that means you know, the output of Q is going to change. It's not going to change because if at least one input of M1 is a zero, the output of M1 is going to be a one. So Q maintains to be a one. But NQ doesn't change either because the output of N1 is maintained, which also means N2 is not going to experience any changes in its input pins. So that means the entire thing stays the same in terms of the output. Okay, so this is just a really quick you know, verbal description of what happens in this particular sequence. You go like, um, okay, I don't see how this has anything to do with memory. Okay, to do with the ability to remember something. Okay, so I'm going to give you a different sequence. Okay, so this is a different sequence. S and R start off with zero again. So Q and NQ are going to be one and one respectively. Okay, same starting point. But what we're going to change is the next step. So the next step is saying, what if we change S from a zero to a one, but we maintain R to be zero? What do you think that's going to happen? Well, if you, if you look at the circuit here, it is a mirror when you look at the top versus the bottom. So if you draw a mirror like here, then the circuit is identical, you know, top and bottom. So that means, you know, when you analyze the circuit, you know, when you flip what you're doing with S and R, you're just changing, you know, Q and NQ accordingly. So that means the output here is going to look like this. Does that make sense? Because the circuit is a mirror image based on the mirror going here. Is that okay? All right. So what is interesting is what if I change the input again, this time we turn it into one and one. Then Q would become a zero and N Q be, you know, maintain, they maintain. Basically, there's no state change in this case. So when you look at this whole thing as quote unquote a truth table, you go like, Hmm, that's kind of interesting because when both S and R are zeros, we have consistently Q and NQ being ones, 
Not a problem, right? When one of them is a zero, the other one is a one, we can quite easily determine that your Q and F Q to be either one zero or zero one, okay? Not a problem, that is pretty deterministic. The issue is, well, it's not the issue, it's actually a feature. The feature is, if you turn both S and R to ones, then it just maintains its previous state. I made a mistake over here. I do apologize, this is a mistake, okay? This should be a zero here. So that means, huh, so when S and R are both ones, <coughs> it is maintaining what is, whatever state it was in, and therefore it is quote unquote a memory device. Are we kind of seeing this as a way of quote unquote remembering something? Not quite what you would think about, right? You know, I want to change this memory location to something. Look, this is the most elemental device when we are thinking about how does a computer remember anything? This is the most elemental mechanism. Almost all of the other devices that can store something, that can remember something, is based on this particular design, which is only using two NAND gates. Are we still doing okay so far with this discussion? What we'll do next Tuesday is we are going to go over the next part of the floating point homework assignment, which is using a positive uh, exponent, that will not take too much time because it really is just kind of the opposite of what we did today. But we'll continue with this discussion here. And the first thing is, how do we analyze a circuit like this? In other words, how do we analyze and conclude that when, the, when both inputs are changing from some unknown state to both zeros, that we know the outputs are going to be both ones? How do we know that when we transition one of the pins from a zero to a one, the circuit will end up with a one and a zero here? And how do we know that when we flip the other pin also from zero to one, the circuit is not gonna do a single thing. It will just maintain its current state. So on next Tuesday, we are going to talk about the analysis of you know, state propagation. It is in the module in a certain way. So I highly encourage all of you to read it ahead of time because it is a really quite useful mechanism for analyzing circuits, especially ones that has a nature of a feedback. So the output of something goes back to the input of something, and in return, that something, the output of that something, also goes back to affect the other one. Is that okay? So I'll give you one thought exercise for those of you who really want to take on the challenge. So I'm going to give you a challenge, and I want you to analyze this. Okay, we give, I give you the, exactly the same input, like so. But then the next state is a simultaneous update of both pins from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And I want you to kind of think about this if you want to, of what's going to happen to the circuit. What is going to happen to Q and NQ if I start with zero, zero for both S and R, but I decide to simultaneously change S and R both to one and one at the same time. So it's a thought exercise, and if you are getting into a, a state where, you know, you go like, um, this is really strange because it, it looks like, you know, so, there's some kind of infinite loop going on here, you would be correct, okay? But I want you to kind of go through your way of analyzing the circuit first, before we talk about it on next Tuesday. So on next Tuesday, I will show you a step-by-step -step systematic way to analyze the circuit to come to the same conclusion. It is a, some kind of an infinite loop, and I will not tell you what's gonna happen to Q and NQ, but it's, it's interesting. All right, we are precisely at 1020, which is great. Um, do we have any questions before I stop the recorder? Okay, yep, go ahead. So next Tuesday is gonna be the same, in, in the, you'll be in the same situation like today because next Tuesday I will give you the positive exponent uh, quote unquote assignment, science lab, which means you know, it's, not, it's gonna be, this will, it will do in, a, in its own week. So it 
two states after next is the due date of the policy and exponent assignment. So that means you know you can stay in the lab to work on it if you want to, and I highly encourage people who have not used the online GDB to spend at least a little bit of time to do it in the lab. Um, but otherwise, you know, there's no requirement to get anything done in the lab. All right. Any other questions? No other questions? All right. So it's only 1020. So just a quick reminder, we have two events you know, happening today. Did I talk about that on Tuesday? No? I may have forgotten to talk about it in this class. Oh, that's because I, I did not know about it you know, at that point in time. Okay, so let me go to announcement and just briefly mention it. Um, the first one is the Uber Mesa event. Did I talk about this? No? Okay, well, we'll talk about it just a little bit. Um, this is happening today, like noon, in one hour and 35 minutes or so. So you can go to this particular event in person, or you can do it online. Um, for whatever reason, you know, Mesa downstairs um, found that you know, Uber is willing to kind of cooperate, and they're going to talk about. Okay, let me scroll down a little bit. This is these are in the announcements. So they will talk about how to launch your career as an engineer. So when they say engineer, I suspect they also include software engineer which basically is kind of like an upgraded version of a developer, which is what most computer science people want to be. So this might be interesting from that perspective, is how do you launch your career? You know, what do you need to do? Is internship important, okay? So I hope this, this particular presentation will answer some of those questions. The other presentation, which is also today, <laughs> is about stress management. And I do have to mention that, you know, yes, I am part of the reason why you guys are feeling stressed out. <laughs> That's part of my job. Is to give you guys a realistic um, rendering of what it is like at a four-year university. It's better to find that out here than after you transfer, trust me. Um, so this one you know, basically talks about it's a college hour event. This one is in person only in the ITC. Um, do you guys know where the ITC is? Yep. It's the boat like building. Do you see a boat like building in that direction of the stand building? It looks like a boat. It has this shape. No? Yes? No? <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be east. So it's to the east of the stand building, and you will. Once you get out the front door here, you will see it because it looks like a boat. So that's the ITC. And in this particular event, you go to the ITC training room, which is the big room. Once you get into the door, it, is, it will be on your left-hand side. Um, it is a, it's hosted by a psychology professor, um, and you know, one of her uh, specialty is uh, stress management. So if you're feeling kind of stressed out, you know, and you want to learn strategies to kind of help de-stress you yourself without playing you know, too many games or using certain substances. Um, I mean, you know, there are legal substances that people can use, but it's not effective. Neither is playing an excessive amount of video game to de-stress, because all that's going to do is to make you tired eventually. And then you, know, you, get, you become even more stressful because now you're not ready to do whatever you think you should be ready to do. So anyway, anyway, uh, this is the other one. Unfortunately, they overlap. They overlap by 45 minutes, which means you probably cannot go to both at the same time. So pick one to go to. And if you have a buddy, you can kind of like, you know, I'll go to this one, you go to the other one, and then we'll kind of exchange material uh, after the, the two workshops. There's that, and also on top of that, we have the Computer Science Club meeting also at exactly the same time. So now you have three events they can choose from. <laughs> all righty, so that's all. This is, this is all I need to disclose today. Um, as I said, you know, I will stay here. If you have any questions, if you want to work on the program a little bit here, I will stay here. Um, Otherwise, have a nice weekend. I'll see you on next Tuesday.